I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, it's our first monthly manure teleconference of the new year. I hope everyone had a good holiday season. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with our calls, they're really informal. So if you got a question, just speak up. Uh, there's really no protocol here. If you got any questions, just speak up. Uh, my name is Peter Sharpie. I oversee the livestock and the manure treatment aspect of Profit Pro. Um, also, if you got a lot of background noise where you're at, uh, press star six and that'll mute you so uh, it doesn't disrupt the call. We got a few other uh, Profit Pro employees on tonight if you'd like to announce yourself. Jason Dorhout. David Whitman. Dave, Dave Prestel. Aaron Jans. Yeah, I think that's, that's everybody. Uh, tonight we're going to do just a real quick discussion on uh, pathogens in manure. There are many different types of pathogens. There are some that are going to affect humans, some that are going to just affect animals, some that are going to be problematic to the soils. We're also going to look at the different ways regulatory organizations such as the EPA detect these pathogens and see if there's a contamination risk in your waterways. We're going to look into the potential risk that these pathogens can have both in the water system and in the soils. And lastly, we're going to look into different ways that we can reduce the pathogens in your manure and the potential risk contamination of your facility. Now, a pathogen is defined as any agent that causes disease or illness. Most commonly, though, it is a microorganism. It can be anything, though. It can be a toxin, a uh, metal poison, just about anything can be a pathogen, but typically we look at microorganisms as the main type of pathogen. Uh, keep in mind, though, that pathogens represent only a small percentage of the microorganisms in the world. Majority of the microbes are very beneficial to their environment, both for humans and animals alike, uh, especially the plant. There's a lot of very good beneficial microorganisms that work with the plant. Uh, your GI tract or your gastrointestinal tract is loaded with beneficial microbes. Without them, digestion absorption of nutrients would almost be impossible. Your immune system functions very heavily dependent on microbes in your gut. Of the pathogenic microorganisms in the environment, even a smaller population is what we call zoonotic. Zoonotic pathogens have the ability to affect different species, which means they can infect animals and people. There are very, very few bugs that can do this. Most, pa most pathogens are very host specific. They depend on a specific environment, a specific cell to infect. Only a few of them are capable of adapting and infecting both humans and people, or, or both animals and people, I mean, or even pigs and cattle, or poultry and cattle. They're very animal specific. It's the, but it is the zoonotic pathogens that will pose a risk to our human health. Other pathogens can pose serious biosecurity bio risks to other animals and farms. For example, PED in, the swine, in swine manure is a pathogen that is not at all harmful to humans, but is a serious risk for hog farmers today. So tonight, we're going to start out by talking more about the zoonotic manure-borne pathogens. And when we start talking about microorganisms, it's important to know that not all microbes are the same. For example, all bacteria are microbes, but all, not all microbes are bacteria. There are five very specific classes of microbes. There's the bacteria, which are the most common and the most prevalent. Then there's viruses, protozoans, fungi, and algae. Each mo microbe functions differently and has a different diet and has a different potential to become pathogenic. Viruses, for example, have a very unique and very interesting method of reproduction. Um, they don't split cells like a bacteria does. They actually attach to a host cell, and they'll insert a copy of their genetic material into that cell. Then that cell replic replicates its DNA in order to, to uh, split and multiply its own method. But instead of replicating its DNA, it replicates the virus. And all of a sudden, you got this one host cell producing all kinds of viruses within itself, and they build up and they build up and the cell ruptures. And all the new viruses are free to affect new host cells, and the original host is destroyed. Because of this very parasitic nature of reproduction, 
Virus research has only looked at them as pathogens. But new research is being done, and discoveries are being made that to suggest that there are actually some beneficial viruses in nature. There aren't many, but there are a few. Uh, they looked at mucosal layers in the respiratory tract of humans and animals, and they found that there are many viruses that exist in that layer that attack pathogenic bacteria. So that's going to be a very new and developing field. Um, beneficial viruses is something very new and fascinating. Algae, on the other hand, is pretty much non-pathogenic. It simply absorbs sunlight, like a plant, to sustain its existence. Bacteria, protozoan, and fungi, they're mostly non-pathogenic, but they are the common, most common pathogens that we know. Bacteria would be the most common. Uh, your uh, E. coli is a bacteria. Uh, there's all kinds of bacterial infections that can cause people illness. Uh, bacteria and fungi both can produce different toxins and chemicals that can cause reactions in the human body, and that's what causes you to get sick. Unlike animals, bacteria don't digest their food internally. They do it externally. They'll secrete enzymes, which break down their food prior to absorbing the nutrients through their cell wall. These enzymes produce can be pathogenic. Some of the bacteria that produce enzymes are capable of breaking down body tissue, and this is where we get flesh-eating bacteria. On the other hand, these, some bacteria are very beneficial by producing enzymes and chemicals that destroy pathogenic bacteria. When we are dealing with livestock and manure, we really only need to concern, concern ourselves with the pathogens capable of sur surviving in manure or manure-borne pathogens. In the group of manure-borne pathogens, we have pathogens that can only affect certain species of animals, pathogens that can, that can cause serious issues with the soil and plant development, and path pathogens that can affect multiple species, and these are the zoonotic. I would like to start the discussion by discussing the zoonotic pathogens, which pose the risk to human health. These zoonotic pathogens will include bacteria, viruses, protozoan, and a few parasitic worms, which we actually won't get into. We'll focus mostly on the bacteria, the viruses, and the protozoa. The most well-known bacterial pathogen is E. coli. But more specifically, E. coli 0157 colon H7. There are hundreds of strains of E. coli bacteria out there, and a majority of them are non-pathogenic. And even many of them are beneficial E. coli. And and they help with the digestion. E. coli are considered coliforms. Coliforms are extremely common in all forms of manure and actually make up a large portion of the bacteria in the intestinal tract. In one gram of swine manure, you can find over 3.3 million coliforms. That is a lot of bacterial cells, it's a ton. And just because an E. coli strain is found, does not necessarily mean that that E. coli is a pathogenic E. coli 0157H7. Now, we all know the symptoms of E. coli infection. You get the diarrhea. You get the abdominal pain, the fever, all kinds of things in young children and old adults that can cause death. And the trouble is it only takes a few cells to get sick, five to ten cells, and you've got infection. Other bacterial contaminants include Salmonella, Campylobacter, uh, Yersinia intercoli, and the last is uh, Listeria monocytogenic. Uh, salmonella is very common in poultry. It can be found in swine and cattle, but not as common. That's going to give you the fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, or dehydration. And that one's got an infectious dose of about 100 to 1,000 cells. Campylobacter you're looking at less than 500 cells and you're sick. Same thing, GI distress. Uh, this one is usually common in uh, contaminated water sources. The Yersinia, very, very common in swine manure. It's almost exclusively found in, in swine. Very high infectious dose, dose. It requires millions of these cells to get affected. So it's not a real big issue. And the Listeria one, it can be found in any type of, of uh, manure, most common in, in ruminants. But you're looking, the trouble with this one is it takes very little to get sick, 
and you get some meningitis, which is an infection of the brain, uh, headache. I know Dave Pressel can talk a little bit about meningitis if he wanted to, but it is not a fun bacteria to be infected with. The virus, they tend to be less zoonotic. Viruses are much more species specific, and this is due to their infectious nature or their reproduction method, where they have to attach themselves to a specific cell in order to reproduce. Where we see a lot of zoonotic viruses is going to be in the swine industry, because hogs are very, very close to human beings, and the viruses can tend to uh, adapt and infect both. Most commonly, we see a flu virus is very common to pass from pig to human, but that is not a manure-borne pathogen. On the proto protozoan side, we have uh, Cryptosporidium, Cryptosporidium, and Giardia. Giardia is very common. Uh, it causes GI, gastrointestinal illness, very treatal, treatable, non-fatal. Contaminated water is the main source of infection. When you look at the Cryptosporidium, you're looking at once again, gastrointestinal distress, diarrhea. Contaminated water or food. The issue with the cryptosporidium is there is no treatment. And for people who are immunocompromised, the very elderly, very young, or sick, it can be fatal. Now, from a human health point of view, the biggest issue with these zoonotic manure-borne pathogens is how humans come in contact with them and how do we detect for them. These pathogens have very, very good survival rates in manure. Most of them can live indefinitely in manure. But that's not really a big issue on the human health side. Nobody's going out there and eating lots of manure, or at least I hope not. Uh, it's when, people, when this manure comes in contact with food or water that we have a risk on the human health side. We've all heard about the E. coli outbreaks. Uh, they're always on the news, latest big outbreak in California with spinach. Animals de defecated the E. coli bacteria onto the spinach. E. coli can be killed with by heating it or cooking it to a certain degree. But since you usually eat spinach raw, lots of people got infected. E. coli and livestock production was, of course, blamed. Unfortunately, running water over the leaves is not sufficient to remove the bacterial cells. Uh, there's even talk about how when you're doing your garden, how people say you shouldn't use manure as a fertilizer in your garden for the risk of E. coli infections. And it's not that manure isn't a great fertilizer and isn't going to be very beneficial in your garden. Just improper manure often contains pathogens. However, in the Midwest, the risk of food contamination with manure-borne pathogens is extremely low. Water contamination is where the issue is going to be. Manure-borne pathogens can easily travel through the soil, can get into the water, and can survive a long time in the water. The issue comes when we have concentrated amounts of manure. Iowa is ranked thir the third highest manure-producing state in the nation. Minnesota and South Dakota are not far behind at the 9 and 10 spots, respectively. All that manure has to go somewhere. With the with the volume of manure handled by producers today, the risk for potential water con contamination is increased. Everyone here will agree that manure is not only a waste product to be disposed of, but it al is also a great fertilizer. And every year, millions of gallons of manure are applied to the land across the Midwest at rates of several thousand gallons to the acre. The concentration of animal production facilities has led to more manure available to utilize this fertilizer. But it is when these large quantities of manure are applied to the same land that we run the risk of contamination of the water with the manure-borne pathogens. As I mentioned earlier, these pathogens can live indefinitely in manure. Their survival rate in water and soil is slightly more varied. E. coli, for example, can live indefinitely in any of the three environments. Manure, soil, water, it doesn't matter, it survives. While the Campylobacter survives only up to approximately 60 days in soil and water. For the protozoan, the Cryptosporidium is indefinite in all three. It's going to survive. While Giardia, 
that is limited to only 28 days in the soil and 77 days in the water. The longer the survival rate in the soil and the water, the greater risk to human infection. So it's really all about timing. I would also like to point out, before we get too deep into the water contamination subject of today, that a majority of waterborne <coughs> outbreaks from manure-borne pathogens has actually come from con water contaminated with human fecal mate material and not livestock. So that's something we, the livestock producers have going for us. We're not the main cause of contamination of water. But that being said, it is still extremely important for us as producers to protect, protect our image and our industry. We need to do everything we can to prevent any type of contamination. Any bad publicity for the livestock industry is not just all around not good for everybody. The EPA does list microbial contamination as the leading cause of river and stream impairment. Giardia, that protozoan that's very infectious, has been found in both surface and groundwater. And when we start getting into the groundwater, we run the risk of well infections. The surface water, your lakes, your rivers and streams, you go swimming, you can pick it up that way, and nobody wants that. Water can come contaminated in a few different ways. Obviously, the simplest and the easiest way is somebody directly dumping manure into a waterway which doesn't happen very often, at least I would prefer to believe so. Manure runoff from ground applied manure from ground applied manure is another risk. You go out there and you spread your manure, you got a lot of rain, washes it away into a river, we could have an issue there. The last method of contamination is groundwater contamination. This one's really interesting. Because for a number of years they figured the soil will filter the bacteria and the pathogens out. Well, recent research has suggested that that's not actually true. The ability of the soil to uh, filter out the bacteria is varied depending on the soil. It's going to depend on the chemical and uh, mineral composition of the soil. So the charge of the soil, is it going to attract the bacteria or the pathogens, or is it going to repel them? If you've got a higher low pH, it's going to affect the ability of the pathogens to move through there. Plus the type of soil, if it's very porous, it's going to move through a little bit easier. If it were more, more dense, it's going to move through slowly. And it's all going to depend. How deep is your water table? How far does the bacteria have to travel? How many days is it going to have to survive in that soil before it reaches the water to contaminate it? The EPA and the pollution control agencies that are, are responsible for re regulating manure contamination. They oversee the building and operation facilities and make plans for prevention of contamination. And then they find those that fail to comply with their rules. In the event of a contamination or an outbreak, they will be looking for the reason for the outbreak. Basically, they're looking to find who to point a finger at. As producers, it is our job to ensure they can't point that finger at the livestock industry. But the question is, how do they find out where the pathogens came from? How do they determine if pathogens are present in a water sample, in a manure sample, in soil? The protozoan pathogens, they're very large. They're easier to spot. They're easier to detect. But the outbreaks from pathogens are fairly rare, or from protozoan are a little bit more rare, mainly because of their difference in uh, survival rates. The major source of illness from manure-borne pathogens is going to come from the bacteria. The bacteria are very adaptable. They have long survival rates. There's more chance of them becoming zoonotic. And manure, all manure, is just loaded with a multitude of many, 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 many different species of bacteria. And then when you have a single species of bacteria, there are many, many, many different strains of that single species. So to test a sample, whether it be water, soil, and manure, for a specific pathogenic strain of bacteria is extremely costly, extremely time-consuming, because you'd have to take that sample. You'd have to grow it. You'd have to isolate each bug. Then you'd have to grow each bug. And then you'd have to run DNA tests on each bug to determine exactly what strain it would be. It takes time. takes money. 
they don't do it. They're not, when they test a water sample for pathogens, they are not testing for E. coli 0157H7. They are not testing for specific listeria. They are not testing for specific salmonella. In order to determine if the sample has been contaminated with a manure-borne pathogen, and typically that sample is water, they look for what they call fecal indicating bacteria. Now, fecal indicating bacteria are non-pathogenic. They are harmless bacteria, but they are typically seen living in the same environment as a manure-borne pathogen. So when they, see, when they go and they take a sample and they find these FIBs or these fecal indicating bacteria, they say, this water is contaminated or this is contaminated with manure-borne pathogens. When we start looking at the, the fecal indicating bacteria, the most common one that they test for is E. coli. It's not the pathogenic E. coli of 0157 colon H7, it's just E. coli. They also test for enterococci, which is another common fecal indicating bacteria. Uh, Clostridium perfringes is another one, and there's a couple other ones. But here's the thing. E. coli, enterococci, they're found in all manure. Nearly 100% of the time, you will find some form of E. coli in manure. Let's think about that. The EPA comes to your place and they test some water, they find E. coli, they've got you for manure contamination of a water source. There may not be any pathogen there, but there is E. coli there. So then they are assuming there are pathogens. It's really hard to test for single pathogens. It's really hard to, back, to defend yourself that there aren't any pathogens when they're not looking for them. It's just when these bacteria, these fecal indicating bacteria are found, it's assumed pathogens are present. This means that whenever or wherever manure is found, these regulatory groups are saying there are pathogens there. They must exist. If manure is there, there's pathogens, there's a human risk. There's a human health risk. Tonight, later tonight, we'll discuss a few ways to reduce and even eliminate the pathogens in your manure but we can't remove the fecal indicating bacteria. Unless you completely and chemically sterilize your manure, which would be both very costly and very detrimental if you want to use it as a fertilizer, we can't remove those FIBs. In 2006, there was a bill before Congress. The EPA was pushing to get manure, any and all manure from livestock, to be listed as a hazardous material. They view manure, all manure, as a risk to human health. They don't understand what it is. They don't understand how important it is. They're just afraid of it, and they assume it's a risk. They want to list it as hazardous material. If you look at your production and your system out there, your own farm, what would that mean for you if your manure was listed as hazardous material? The licensing, the certification, the things you would have to do, the loops, and the red tape you'd have to go through to even have manure on your site would be astronomical. But this is what they want. And honestly, who can blame them? Improperly handled manure is very disgusting, and we all know it. It's putrid. It smells awful. It's full of solids that cling to every surface it touches. It doesn't come clean. It contains foam that's dangerous and explosive. Every year there are stories of people and animals being killed as a result of manure gases. It doesn't have to be this way. But before we get into the methods available for re reducing these manure-borne pathogens and improving what I call the public image of livestock manure, I'd like to go into more, discuss more effects of manure-borne pathogens on not just humans, but on livestock and soil as well. The major buzzword in the livestock industry is biosecurity. Everybody's concerned about biosecurity. You need to protect your farm, you need to protect your livestock, you need to protect your animals. Your manner of making a living, you have to protect that from pathogens, from disease. You need to keep it safe, you need to keep it healthy. And we do that through biosecurity. 
when we start talking about the swine industry, the next word of the year is PED, or porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. That is a manure-borne virus that is just a, that's not a concern for human health, but it is a serious, serious, serious concern for the swine industry. Our livestock are more susceptible to manure-borne pathogens than humans are because we remove the zoonotic factor. Cattle manure that contains pathogens from cattle are going to affect other cattle. Swine, swine, poultry, poultry, it's all the same. We need to protect ourselves. When handling manure, whether it is liquid or dry, it is, do, it is important to do so to prevent perpetuating any infection. We don't want to move it from farm to farm. We don't want to pass it along. This fall, for the swine industry, the pit pumpers, I know was particularly difficult. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear if we have any uh, manure pumpers online tonight. Do we? We don't. Okay. Well, I talked to one out of northeastern Iowa. He was working with uh, Iowa Select. They dropped their pumpers down this year to 20. Very selective on who they took to pit pump their pit. They did full background check, five years, driving records. They checked it all before they even invited them to a meeting to try and pump their barns. When they were there, the clean, dirty line was at the property line. Usually it's at the door of the facility. This time it was at the property line. They brought a truck in. They brought their equipment in. It was disinfected before it crossed that road. They weren't even allowed to drive on the main driveway. They had to drive on the grass to prevent the other vehicles from picking up manure. As soon as they got out of their vehicle, plastic boots, white suits, rubber gloves the whole time. If they were bringing gas to fill their tra tractors and their pumps, truck off-site would go get the gas, bring it to the property line, truck in-site would drive to the property line, pick up the gas, and take it there. Everything was disinfected as soon as it got on the site. It was disinfected when it left. That is an extreme hassle for anybody to deal with. Uh, another pit pumper we worked with met with a sow company in Minnesota. They want their pumpers to wash between finisher sites to prevent this de disease from spreading. And the fact of the matter, it didn't work. Over 4,600 cases of PED virus in the United States since May of this year, of last year. So even biosecurity isn't stopping this particular manure-borne pathogen. When we start looking at the soil, these manure-borne pathogens pose as much risk to our soils and to our crops as they do to, our hum to humans and our livestock. There's an extremely delicate and extremely fascinating little ecosystem at the root of the plant, right in the area known as the ribosphere. There's bacteria, there's fungi, there's protozoan, and there's even viruses that play an important role in plant health, growth, performance, and yield. They can also play a very big role in plant disease, stunting, or death. The key to a healthy, well-doing plant is good, healthy soil. The first step to healthy soil is a balanced population of healthy, beneficial microbes. You need the right amount of bacteria on that plant surface, those bacteria colonize the plant root. Fungus, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, will connect to a plant root and grow for miles and miles and miles and bring nutrients back to that plant. Those bacteria, that plant root produces sugars. The bacteria eat the sugars. Protozoan come along and eat the bacteria. The protozoan poop out nitrogen right there in the plant root zone. If you have mineral bonded in your soil, calcium phosphate, any type of magnesium bonded to something, the only thing that's going to break that down is biology. The only thing that's going to make those nutrients available to your plant is biology, good, beneficial biology. Now, if you're a producer applying manure to your soil, then your soil health is directly linked to the biology in the manure. If your manure is way out of whack, if you've got tons and tons of pathogens in your manure, if you've got no fungus, if you don't have the right bugs in that manure, 
you don't have the right bugs in your soil. The pathogens in your manure are transferred to your field. Uh, some, a project we were recently working on is with uh, dry composting. It's a new project we're going to start working with. And aerobically breaking down manure is a great way to get beneficial microbes going and break down and remove those pathogens. Uh, Jason Dorholt, maybe you'd like to, to uh, describe your experience with some not-so-good manure composting. Yeah, Peter, we, um, there's a company locally in northwest Iowa here that uh, is composting cattle manure with bedding, et cetera, in it. And like you had mentioned, pathogens, without adding any biology to it, you cannot break it down completely. And so it is extremely potent as far as smell goes. And you cannot... Dave and I have visited the, the facility, and it, you can't get the stink off of your boots, off out of your car. Um, it's just very, very potent. You cannot get away from that. And then you did some work with some trying to, what's it like trying to grow something in that type of environment? We're trying to grow a plant. I took, I had uh, about, just imagine a 55-gallon drum. Um, cut about a foot tall. I filled it with the compost, and I planted alfalfa, soybeans, and corn in it. And I did, could not find, I planted approximately 20 seedlings of corn and beans, and probably double that of alfalfa. And I could not find a single uh, seed that had germinated. Nothing grew. Absolutely nothing. The reason for that is that manure was very, very high in, in various types of pathogens. And pathogens thrive in terrible environments. They thrive in the environments where the beneficial microbes cannot survive. They will do all that they can to keep their environment harsh and chemically loaded, loaded with salt and various chemicals to keep those, bad, those good bacteria out of there. And the reason they do that is the good bacteria are capable of kicking them out. The process of called competitive exclusion. Whoever is the biggest number in town is going to win the environment. So if you've got a lot of pathogens, the good ones can't grow. They're not going to survive. They're not going to make it. The pathogens are going to take that environment, they're going to make it awful, and they're going to keep it awful. The good bacteria do the opposite. They make it a good environment that they can survive in. They produce toxin, they produce enzymes to get rid of the pathogens, and they keep them out of there. But the pathogens have adapted to survive in those environments, and they keep them that way. And as we talk about the characteristics of this environment, of this nasty, putrid environment, it's going to be very high in chemicals, very high in salt, very low in oxygen. You're not going to have the right blend of organisms for a plant to grow and you're going to put this on their soil and expect something to grow. And it just isn't going to happen. They're going to, take, they're going to turn your soil into what they did to the manure. Now, there are several ways that we can reduce the pathogens in manure. Um, some of them are very inexpensive. Some of them are extremely expensive. One method is through chemical treatment. This one, like... Chemical treatment, you can just douse it with chlorine. You're going to sterilize it. You won't have anything growing. Now, that's extremely expensive, extremely effective, very, very effective. You're going to remove all pathogens, zoonotic, soil-borne, whatever, it's gone. But then you have no, no good biology for your soil, which is very necessary. As we discussed, you need those soil-borne pathogens. If you put that chlorine on your soil, you kill the pathogens or the bacteria and the microbes in your soil. Another method is ultraviolet light radiation. Irradiation. You take that manure and you pass it through some ultraviolet UV lights. That's going to kill the bugs too. A little more time-consuming. Not too much. A little bit of startup cost, but maintaining cost wouldn't be too bad. You can also pasteurize it, similar to the way they do milk. Just heat that manure way up. Cook it. Pathogens can't survive in the heat. 
you're done. A little costly, time consuming, and you'd have to make sure you let it cool before you apply it to the land. Anaerobic digesters are very common nowadays. More and more people are putting these up, particularly with dairies. These harness, these uh, the met methanogens or the methane producing bacteria become the dominant species in the manure inside this anaerobic digester. Now you're able to harness the methane for energy. Little problem when you when you uh, apply it onto the soil. Your soil biology is a little out of whack, but if you know what you're doing, you can fix that before soil application. You got energy. You got the methane take, or you got you got energy, and you got the pathogens taken out. Not a bad way to go. The next step is uh, aerobic composting. Very simple with dry manure if you know what you're doing. You have to execute it effectively. Uh, the manure we were discussing with Jason was not properly aerobically digested. The, the pathogens, they like that anaerobic environment. They don't want to live in the high oxygen level. So if you turn it effectively and you get the oxygen level right, and the moisture level right, on dry composting, it can be very effective. For liquid manure, it's also very effective. It's just a little bit more costly to uh, install and maintain. And you're going to have to have an, aer an aerator in your lagoon or in your barn. You're going to have lines going under your pit to keep air flowing in your pit 24-7 to keep those, bu uh, those aerobic bacteria working. Um, I've actually heard of this being done a couple of times, but not very often. The final method we'll discuss is one that Profit Pro excels at, and that is the biological treatment. You load your, your manure up with good biology, good facultative anaerobes, so they're going to work in the anaerobic environment, they're going to work in the aerobic environment, and your good bi biology outnumbers the bad. The trouble with this method is your, your fecal indicating bacteria are still going to be present. So even, even though your manure is completely free of pathogens and it's perfectly safe, regulating companies might not see it that way. But on the other hand, it's going to be a lot more user friendly, a lot better public image because the odor is going to be reduced. The crusting is gone, the flies are gone, that nasty putrid solids at the bottom of the pit are gone. So it's just a lot easier to look at. Uh, it cleans up a lot nicer. It's going to be a lot nicer product to handle. And the public is going to respond to it a little bit better than they will something that is not treated and very putrid and very nasty. Um, also, by putting the good biology in your manure, you're going to put the good biology in your soil, and that is going to boost your yield. That is going to boost your fertilizer value because those biology continue to work for you into the soil around the plant root. You get good bacteria going there. The plant root attracts them. Those bacteria attract protozoan, fungi, which attract earthworms and nematodes. And all of a sudden, you've got a really good, healthy soil full of, bio, full of diverse biology, and you're growing some stellar plants. The trick with the biological treatment is you've got to find the right one. There are hundreds of products on the market all kinds of products, highly expensive ones, extremely cheap ones. You really got to ask the right question. First question to ask is, how many bacteria are in this product? How many different species? And how are they contained? Are they alive? Are they preserved? Is there one species, two species, five species, 17 species? What are they? Um, are they all out of one family, or do we have a multitude of families? Uh, when you're looking at different bacteria, an important one to look for is the purple non-sulfur bacteria. Those are very effective at chewing up the solids in the bottom. And in the lagoon, it gives it a nice little reddish, pinkish hue when it's effectively working. The other thing to look at is the survivability in the harsh environment of harsh manure environment. We talked about those pathogens keeping that environment nasty. They want it nasty. They like it nasty. They're going to keep it nasty. And if you put some bacteria in there, they got to be strong enough to overcome that environment. If you put some weakly little nerdy bacteria in there, 
it's just not going to work. It's going to die. It's going to get butt kicked by the pathogens. But if you put some good, strong bacteria in there that can out hammer those pathogens, then you got something that's going to work. The next thing is you put these pathogens in there, what are they going to work on? What are they going to live on? They, you got any food in that product, any sort of mineral in that product? Because what they're going to eat now is nasty. It's full of chemicals. It's full of pathogens. It's going to take them a little bit of time to adjust that, to fix it, to change it into something that they can use. And then the final and most important thing to look at when you're looking at your pit treatments is your expense versus the expense of the product, the amount of the product applied, and the effectiveness. When you're looking at it, you need to overwhelm that pit with good biology. You can't just put in a few to combat thousands. I mean, you're not going to, you know, 20 soldiers are not going to win against 5,000 soldiers. You need to overwhelm that pit with good, strong biology and tons of them, just a multitude. And if it's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars to do it, that product might not be the right one. And even if and if you're only going to if it's going to be really cheap, but you're only putting a few in there, it might not be all that effective. So that's kind of the different methods of treatment. I want to I want to end my part of the conversation. Unless do we have any questions thus far? I kind of ran through everything pretty quickly. I had a lot to cover. Real quick question for you, Peter. Yes. Uh, has it ever been studied, do, do the pathogenic viruses and, and bacteria, do they prefer a cooler temperature or a warmer temperature? Or does that make any uh, difference, effect on who controls the, the environment? That's going to be uh, uh, very species specific when you're looking at viruses. A lot of viruses are going to go dormant in the wintertime and extreme heat will kill them. Uh, bacteria, extreme heat will kill them. Uh, pathogens often don't handle really hot temperatures. The good biology, they're going to handle a more wider range of, uh, of uh, temperature. But like I said, it's also going to be very, very species specific. If we start talking about the PED, that one they found, temperature really doesn't bother it one little bit. They thought with this winter month and the cooling down, it would slow it down a little bit. It hasn't. It's still very prevalent and still very infectious. If you start looking at PERS, which I know is not a manure, which is a little bit of a manure-borne pathogen, but it's more of an airborne pathogen, we hit those summer PERS virus shuts down. We hit the winter months, PERS virus shuts down. It's when we're in that cool, wet fall and spring that PERS is just flying everywhere. So it's going to depend a little bit on the, on the species of bug. If you're looking at the good biology to treat your pit with, you're going to want something that's going to be most active in that 80 to 100 to 110 range. Um, that's going to help keep your pit warmer. It's going to help keep it from freezing. Um, if you've got an outside lagoon, it's going to thaw out a little bit faster. And when you get those biology on the soil, like I said, bacteria, they like to adapt their environment to what they want, to what they survive in. So if they like the temperature a little warmer, they're going to generate a little heat and keep it warmer. So on your soil, keeps your ground a little bit warmer. Um, if you notice good, really biologically active soils in springtime, their snow is going to melt off just a little bit faster. In the fall, they're going to stay a little bit blacker before the other ones turn white. And that's just because bacteria are capable of adapting their environment in little ways for them to survive. And that's one they do. They generate heat and keep it warm. Any other questions? We got about ten minutes. I'm, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our product that we have available that is very effective at treating manure and getting rid of those manure-borne pathogens, and getting rid of the bottom solids, and getting the crust, and improving, you know, the overall public image of that manure to make it a much easier product to deal with to reduce the smells. And that's called Microbial Manure Master. What that product has is 17 strains of bacteria. Uh, I've talked to a lot of growers. I've talked to a lot of producers. I've talked to a lot of competition. I have not found a single one that can tell me they have 17 strains of bacteria, and they're very different strains. All, uh, there's at least six different classes of bacteria. We've got the purple non-sulfur bacteria in there. 
Uh, we have some enterococci. We have some lactobacillus. Lactobacillus are very good at killing off pathogens. They produce lactic acid, which deteriorates pathogens. The other thing about our product is they're live, active bugs. We don't preserve them. We brew it up here in the warehouse, so when you get it, those bugs are live and active. If you take your two and a half gallon jug or your tow to the product, whatever you get, and you leave it sitting in the sun, you're going to watch that container blow up because they're producing different gases. They're going to pop that top off. They're live. They're ready to go. The next thing, we don't we include food and we include minerals for those bugs. 75 trace elements and a superfood for bugs that nobody else has on the market. And this gives them something to go on. They go in the pit. They don't have to just eat the manure in the pit. They got this to get started so that they can change the manure. They can make it more tasty for themselves. And the last thing about it, if you get on our manure treatment service, this is something that we offer to our guys that are fairly local. We're going to go in on a manure treatment service, and we're going to visit your farm three times. We used to do it on a monthly basis, but due to biosecurity and due to the effectiveness of the product that we have at our disposal, we cut it back to three times a month or three times a year. And if you've got a million-gallon pit, we're going to dump 325 gallons of our product in each year. That is more than any other company can offer. I can guarantee that. At the cost that we're offering it. For a million gallons, you're looking at $2,000. And we will overload that pit, and we will guarantee that it'll turn around for you. And you'll get rid of those solids, you'll get rid of the crust, and you'll get rid of the smell. I've seen it happen all year long. I've been watching this happen. Um, we got some phenomenal photos and some phenomenal videos online of satisfied customers that have been on our product and are very pleased with its effectiveness. Any questions on that? Well, if we don't have any questions, we got about seven minutes. I think we'll just cut it early. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming on tonight and for participating in our call. Uh, this has been recorded and it will be up online to watch. I also want to point out to, out to everybody that next month, hopefully, barring all things go well, this will not only be a teleconference call but a webinar which means you will be able to log on in through your computer and you'll be able to see me. And you'll be able to see my computer and I'll have a PowerPoint presentation and a few visuals to go along with it. It's a very simple program to use. We will have our link up on our website. We will also email it out to those of you who are within our database and you just click that link. Um, you may have to download a little program onto your computer. I'm not sure on that. It's called GoToMeeting, but it's a very useful tool. Um, you'll be able to just type your questions in if you have a question. And if you don't have access to a computer, there's a phone number there so you can call in just the same as you did tonight. And I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be a great tool. It's going to offer a little more interaction, a little bit visual aids, and I think people are really going to like it. And that will also be recorded and uh, put online for people to watch later. And with that, I want to thank everybody once again. Hope everybody enjoys the cold weather. And uh, good night.